Okay, we're going to go through a quick uh, little uh, review, relatively quick, um, of uh, the major concepts in Chapter 5. The first thing I want to talk about is something in five one, which we've talked about several times, and that is the law of large numbers. What the law of large numbers is, is this, is that when we have a what we call a population parameter, let's say, for instance, our population is this truckload of potatoes, and the parameter the, is, let's say, the percent or the proportion of the potatoes that are rotten. So let's say it's point, uh, 0.121 or 12.1% uh, of the tomatoes are rotten. So that is our parameter. That is the true value of the whole truckload of these hundreds of thousands of potatoes. All right. Now, we could take a census of all the potatoes and find the actual value, but what we decided to do is we decided to take a sample of, let's say, 100 of the potatoes. Of course, it's critical that these potatoes were gotten randomly if we're going to get useful data. And let's just pretend in this sample, uh, let's say 14 of them ended up being rotten. So our P hat for this, our estimate is 14 out of 100, which is 0.14. So this is the percent in the sample, 14% in the sample that are rotten, and this is the percent in the whole population. And so this is an estimate, this 14% is an estimate of the true value, the true value of all of the hundreds of hundreds of thousands of potatoes. What the law of large numbers says is this, the bigger my sample size is, the closer my estimate will be to the true value. Or in essence, these estimates are what we're going to call statistics. The closer my statistic will be to, and what we call these population true values is, are the parameter. So if it's a proportion, we call the parameter P. That's our notation. That is the true population value. If it's a, and, and for the, uh, a sample proportion, we put a P hat. We put a hat on a lot of our estimates. But let's say it was a mean. So, um, well, first of all, let me say this. All right, the bigger, this, the, the law of large numbers is this. The bigger my sample size is, the closer this will be to that. If I had taken a sample of, let's say, 1,000, n is equal to a thousand, right? I don't know what the proportion would be, but probably in general, it's going to be closer to this 12.1%. And I didn't think they would interrupt me at 5 p.m., but they sure as heck are. Um, Pam Reinhardt, please return to the media center. Pam Reinhardt, please return to the media center. So anyway, um, and then it could be, you know, a mean. Let's say if we wanted to know the mean weight of the potatoes. Let's pretend the true mean weight is 17.217 ounces, okay? That is the weight of all the potatoes on the truck, okay? But my sample statistic is what we call an X bar. And let's say if we took a sample of, of 1,000 potatoes, let's say if we got the mean of 16.721. You know, it's going to be different just because of sampling variability. The law of large numbers says my estimate, my statistic, will get closer and closer, closer and closer to the true value, to the parameter, the bigger my sample size is. The closer my P hat will be to P, the closer my X bar will be to mu. That is the law of large numbers. That's the most important concept in probability as it re relates to AP stats, in my opinion. Now, we got three types of problems, three main types of problems in Chapter 5 that you've, you've got to know how to do. All right, and the first one is a two-way table. So when you encounter something that looks like this, you've got a two-way table, and so this is what you got to do, and make sure you pay attention to what I say in regards to properly, properly show your work. So, um, so this context is the workers at a company are divided into three categories by the company. They're either associates, laborers, or entry level. They are asked their opinion uh, about the work conditions at the company, and the conditions are classified as good, fair, or poor. And so here are the results. There's the, you had 56 of the associates that said there was good conditions, 27 of them said it was poor, fair, and 14 said it was poor, and so forth. And so the first thing you want to do when you encounter two-way tables is come up with what we call the marginal distributions. All right, so we would, you just add up, first of all, all the good ones. These would be the column 
marginal distributions. So when you say 56 plus 48 plus 14, that's 118 by my calculations. And then if you add up the total number of fair, that's 112. And if you add up the total number of poor, that ends up being 112. And when you add up those three numbers, that tells you the total number of employees is 342. And then we have, well, what's the total number of associates? These would be the row marginal distributions, 56 plus 27 plus 14, that's 97. And then 48 plus 49 plus 39, that's 136. And then uh, 14 plus 36 plus 59, that's 109. And when you add up those three numbers, it also adds up to 342. And now we are going to use those numbers to answer whatever questions are being asked. If you randomly select someone from the table, find the probability they'll be an associate or have a poor opinion. There's kind of different ways you can do this. But whenever you see the word or, you add. That's going to be the probability of associate plus the probability of a poor opinion. Okay, but you have to realize whenever you add probabilities, you have to subtract off any overlap between associate and poor opinion because some of the associates have poor opinions and you just counted them twice. So uh, it would be associate and poor opinion. That's our notation for that. And so that's what we call the general addition rule. So you'd say, what's the probability of someone being an associate? Well, there's a total of 97 of them out of the 342. If you were to randomly select one of these people, that's the probability you're gonna, you get an associate. All right, what's the probability of selecting someone with a poor opinion? Well, there's 112 of them. So that'd be 112 out of 342. And then, and then how many people are both associate and a poor opinion, associate and poor opinion? Well, that's 14. And you just counted them twice, and so you got to subtract them off once. And so that ends up being 195 over 342. And that is approximately 0 0.57018. So, you know, make sure and report at least... Um, three sig figs, and that's considered, sh showing these numbers is considered showing your work and something like that. Um, all right, be a laborer and have a poor opinion. All right, so what's the probability of labor and have a poor opinion? That's our notation there. Well, laborers and poor opinion, there's 39. This and that, so there's 39 of those, so that'd be 39 over the total 342. So if you were to randomly select one of these 342 workers, the probability you get a labor and someone with a poor opinion is that. And so that is approximately equal to 0 0.114035. So there we go. What's the probability they have a poor opinion? All right, so the probability they have a poor opinion, you say, well, there's a total of 112 of them. So it'll be 112 out of 342. And so that is approximately equal to 0.32749, okay? Now, what is the probability they have a poor opinion given their entry level? So you may have noticed up here that, that the entry level people are more likely to have a poor opinion, so this is something that we're interested in. So what's the probability they have a poor opinion given entry level? That is our notation, that vertical line segment means given. And so, and this is on your formula sheet. That is the probability of both of those things poor and entry level over the probability of the second one, like that. It's the, so the probability of P given E is the probability of P and E over the probability of E. And so what's P and E? Well, so that, so, um, so anyway, so what, what that ends up being, so given entry level, so given entry level, um, so, you know, in essence, given that it's one of these 109 people, so given that it's one of these 109 people, uh, what's the probability uh, that, um, that they will have a, that they'll have a poor opinion, and it'd be just be 59 over that. So you, in essence, you only, you only look, in essence, at what you're given. So you're, you're given that it's entry level, and so it'd be 59 over that. What's the probability to be an associate given good opinion? Well, you just look just at the good opinions, and there's 118 of them. There's 118 of them. So what's the, um, what's the, uh, what's the, um, Probably they'd be an associate would be 56. And so these, these proportions, by the way, would be 0.54128. And so, and then this one would be 0.47458. Now, by the way, when you look at three and four, 
you, you may notice, well, the probability of a poor opinion is about 33%, but the probability of a poor opinion, given their entry level, goes up to 54%. So those are distinctly not independent. If I told you someone's entry level, their probability of a poor opinion goes up from 33% to 54%. So that's one way of showing uh, independence. And then uh, number six, if you randomly select three workers, what's the probability they will have a good opinion, good opinion about working conditions? A multiple event you have to multiply. So the probability that all three of them uh, will have a good opinion. Well, there's a total of, a, the probability the first one that has a good opinion is 118 out of 342. That's the probability that one randomly selected worker will have a good opinion. Now, given that the first one had a good opinion, what's the probability the second will have, have a good opinion? Well, you just took one of them out. So there's only 117 ones left that have a good opinion over 341 total workers. Now, given that the first two had a good opinion, what's the probability the third one had a good opinion? Well, there's a total of 116 left that have a good opinion at a total of 340. So when you multiply those, that is equal to point zero four zero three nine and so so that that is how you handle that um, in a multiple event you multiply that many times uh, and we were certainly not using replacement here so you had to do to do it in this way all right are are these are these two uh, things independent well when, and like what we said earlier, they're not independent because, look, entry level is more likely to have a poor opinion, and then, uh, you know, the associates are more likely to have a good opinion. So if there was independent, it wouldn't matter which one you pick. They would have, in essence, the same proportions of opinions. But the way you can show independence is you could just pick one of the cells and show this. Like, for instance, if I said, well, if you randomly select one of these people, what's the probability they're an associate? All right. Or if you randomly select one of these people, what's the probability they're good? All right. And you can multiply those things. If they're independent, these two things are going to be equal. Okay. Well, the probability that someone is an associate, there's 97 associates over the total number of 342. What's the probability that someone has a good opinion? Well, that would be 118 out of 342, then if you randomly select one of these people, what's the probability they're an associate and they have a good opinion? That is, there's 56 of them out of 342. And in fact, when you multiply that out, this is 0 0.09786. That is not equal to 56 divided by 342, which is 0 0.1637. Therefore, they're not independent. If these things are not equal, they are not independent, but that's a formula you have to memorize in regards to independence. And so that is, that is, uh, that's pretty much any two-way table question that, uh, that could be asked of you. The next type of problem is a Venn diagram problem. So Venn diagram problems are typically done when you're given the probability of one thing, probably the other, probability of both a lot of times. So let's, so let's look at this one. It says 38% of cars at an automotive factory have a sunroof, 45% have dual exhaust, and 21% have both a sunroof and dual exhaust. If you randomly select one of the cars at the factory, find the probability, and you have to find these probabilities. You notice the probability of one thing, probably the other, and probability of both. And so what we'll do is we'll make a Venn diagram that will allow us to answer our questions, and showing the Venn diagram is, in essence, considered showing your work. And so 38% of a sunroof. So I'll do this, and I'll put 0.38 for 38%. Put that up at the top of the circle. That represents the area of this whole circle. And then 45% have dual exhaust. So I'll put a D for dual exhaust. And so that says 45%. And then it says 21% or both. So that's this football-shaped region. So 45% is, or 0.45 is the area of this whole circle. Then you can find the area of these crescent-shaped regions, which represents dual exhaust but not sunroof, and so that minus that, so that'd be 0.24. Or the area of this crescent-shaped region, that minus that, and so that would be 0.17. And so then you can find the area of the outside. The area of the inside, when you add up these three numbers, so that is going to add up to, let's see, that's going to add up to uh, 0.62, I believe. And so that means that it's got to be 0.38 on the outside. Um, these four areas, this, 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 and this, have to add up to one. Um, 
And, uh, and so now you can answer any question that's being asked. What's the probability but sunroof but not dual exhaust? Well, sunroof but not dual exhaust, that's this 0.17. You know, another way you can think of it is this. He says, well, the probability of sunroof is 38%, so that'd be 0.38, but not dual exhaust, so you got to subtract off the overlap, in other words, the part of the sunroof that has the dual exhaust, and so that is equal to 0.17. A sunroof or dual exhaust, and so that goes back to our addition rule, which we did previously. So that is going to be, or means add, so that's the probability of sunroof, plus the probability of dual exhaust, but I have to subtract off any overlap we have, the cars that have sunroof and dual exhaust, so that'd be sunroof and dual exhaust, okay? And so the probability of sunroof is 0.38, plus the probability of dual exhaust, and so that's 0.45, and then minus the overlap of 0.21, and so that is going to equal to 0.62. So if you randomly select a car, that is the probability of it having a sunroof or dual exhaust, and that's considered sunroof or dual exhaust or both. That is the area of this whole circle. The other way you could find it is just by adding up these three numbers. So, uh, so that is, that is the uh, general addition rule. All right, what is the probability of sunroof given dual exhaust? Our little formula says that's the probability of sunroof and dual exhaust over the probability of the second one. So you just take that and that, well, that's 0.21 over the probability of dual exhaust, and that's 0.45. So that's how you, uh, so that's how you find that, and that's 0.46 repeating. All right, uh, what's the probability of dual exhaust given sunroof? What's the probability of dual exhaust given sunroof? Well, our little formula says that's the probability of both of those things, dual exhaust and sunroof, over the probability of the second one, the probability of the given. And so that's going to be 0.21 over 0.38. And so that, in fact, is going to equal to 0.5526. So um, you may could see how here that they're not independent because in general, the probability that they have dual exhaust is 45%. But given they have a sunroof, now the probability they have dual exhaust goes up to 55%. So they're not independent. If one occurs, the other's more likely to occur. Um, and then the same thing with the sunroof given dual exhaust. In general, 38% of the cars have a sunroof, but given they have dual exhaust, it goes up to almost 47%. And so you can, so you can say either of the things I just said, or if you can say if they're independent, that means the probability of sunroof times the probability of dual exhaust is equal to the probability of sunroof and dual exhaust, the overlap. So to show they're independent, you show that. And so that would be probability of sunroof 0.38 times the probability of dual exhaust 0.45. And in fact, uh, is that equal to the, the probability of both 0.21? And in fact, uh, uh, 0.38 times 0.75 is 0.171. That is not equal to 0.21. And so you'd say, therefore, they're not independent. If it's not equal, it's not independent. Um, and so then we have, if you randomly select four cars in the factor, what is the probability they all have sunroof, assuming there's a large number? And so, the, well, the probability that one of them will have a sunroof is 38%, okay? And so, the pro and so the probability of multiple events, you have to multiply that four times. So times 0 .3, 0 0.38, times 0.38, times 0.38. And so, in other words, that's 0.38 to the fourth power. And that is equal to 0 0.020851. So it's sort of an unlikely thing to happen. So you multiply those probabilities. That's assuming that one of two things, that we're either using replacement to where it wouldn't be changing the probability, because if we didn't use replacement, we'd be taking those cars um, out, of, um, out of our population. Um, or, like it says here, assuming there's a very large number of cars such that it really wouldn't change it significantly. For instance, what if it had 900 cars and you're not using replacement? What's the probability you get four of them without sunroofs? Well, when you take uh, 0.38 times 900, if 38% of these cars have a sunroof, that means there's 342 that have a sunroof. So the probability that you'd select one of them and it would have a sunroof would be 342 out of 900. 
And then since you're not using replacement, given the first car has a sunroof, what's the probability the second car will have a sunroof? Well, there's only 341 of them left that have sunroofs, and there's only 899 cars. All right, given the first two cars have sunroofs, the probability the next one have a sunroof will be 340 out of 898. And then lastly, given the first three cars have sunroof, the probability that the fourth one has a sunroof is going to be 339 out of 897. When you multiply those, in fact, you get 0 0.0206247. Notice how close these two numbers are. The, the reason they're so close is because 900 is a relatively big population size. And the bigger your population size is, the closer this will be to that. And that's really more of an issue later in the year. And you say, well, how big does our population need to be? At least 10 times our sample size. But that's an issue for later in the year. But that's, that's pretty much everything that can happen to you in regards to uh, a Venn diagram. And the last uh, major sort of problem is... Uh, a tree diagram problem. Tree diagram problems we typically do when we're given conditional probabilities. The probability of one thing given another. So when it's when it gives you a, a conditional thing of the probability of this given that, or if it says if this is true, the probability that this will happen is, and so that sort of thing. And that happens here. And so uh, it says 80% of people that live in a village dress up like a turkey on Thanksgiving Day. If they dress up like a turkey, there's a 70% chance they'll overeat on that day. Well, that's a conditional probability. So we're probably going to be making a tree diagram. Um, of those that don't dress up like a turkey, 10% of them overeat. So that's another way of, of a conditional statement. The probability of one thing given another. Given they don't dress up like a turkey, there's only a 10% chance they're going to uh, overeat on Thanksgiving Day. If you randomly select one of the villagers, find the probability, and we'll have to find these probabilities. So we'll make our, we'll make our tree diagram. And uh, so it, it says this. It says 80% dress up like a turkey. So, so I'll do this. So we'll say, I'll say T for dressing up like a turkey, and it says 80% of them, so I say 80% of that. So that means T complement, it means 20% don't dress up like a turkey and so these pairs of these pairs of branches will always have to add up to one given they don't dress up like a turkey there is a 70 percent chance um, that they will overeat so i'll put uh, o for overeating and o complement means they're not overeating and so that has to be 0.3 if there's a 70 percent chance they're overeating there's a 30 percent chance they're not of course that's given that they dress up like a turkey given they don't dress up like a turkey the probability they're going to overeat is just 10 percent so that means the probability they won't overeat is 90 percent so these are distinctly not independent Okay, if, if someone dresses up like a turkey, they're much more likely to overeat, and so that means they're not independent. If they're independent, it means it wouldn't matter whether they dressed up like a turkey or not. They'd have the same uh, probability chance of overeating. And so we'll find the probabilities of each of these four events. So this represents uh, they dress up like a turkey and they overeat, and you multiply the two limbs that get there, 0 0.8 times 0 0.7, and that's 0 0.56. And then what about what proportion of people dress up like a turkey and they don't overeat and that's 0.24 and you notice that uh, that these two things add up to the branch that they came from and so then this what if you randomly select one of these people what's probably they don't dress up like a turkey and uh, they do overeat and so that's that times that it's just two percent of people 0.02 and then uh, lastly the probability that they don't dress up like a turkey and they don't overeat and that's that times that and that's 0.18 and so these proportions here are the proportion of these two things happening whereas these proportions here are the proportion of this happening given that has occurred so there's a difference between someone overeating given they've dressed like a turkey and someone doing both of those events at this and so uh Anyway, and so let's let's see if we can answer these questions. All right, so it says, what's the problem they overeat on Thanksgiving Day? That occurs twice. That occurred that event. These people overeat. These fifty-six percent of people overeat, and also these two percent of people overeat. So you would say 0.56 plus 0 0.02, and that's 0.58. And showing your work is showing the tree diagram and just showing that addition. That would be considered showing your work. All right, so that, those are the two events where overeating occurs, and so I add them together. Where these two events, overeating does not occur, so they don't, they don't count. And so then it says this. What's the probability 
They'll dress like a turkey given they overeat. Well, we consult our conditional formula again. That's the probability of both of those things. Turkey and overeating over the probability of the second one, overeating. Well, turkey and overeating, that's here. So that it would be 0.56 over overeating. Now, that's what we just found in number 15 there. And so that would be 0.58. And so that is equal to 0.96. 5517 five, approximately. So in other words, if someone is, if, if, if given someone's overeating in this place, they almost certainly are dressed up like a turkey. Um, all right, and then it says this, what's the probability uh, that someone uh, that they don't dress up like a turkey, turkey compliment, given that they don't overeat? Well, let's consult our formula again. So that's the probability of both of those things. So that is the probability of they don't dress up like a turkey and they don't overeat over the probability of the second one. They don't overeat. Well, not dressing like a turkey and not overeating, that's these people. That's 0.18. And then what, what is the probability, what proportion of people don't dress up like a turkey? That is this event and this event. And when you add those up, that adds up to 0.42. So 0.42, because the not overeating people occur here and here. So you add them up, and so that, in fact, is equal to 0.42857, right like that. And then, uh, and then lastly, if you randomly select five villagers, what's the probability that none of them are dressed like turkeys? Well, it says 80% are dressed like turkeys. That means that 20% of them are not dressed like turkeys. So what's the probability you're gonna have five people that are not dressed like turkeys? And so that, in fact, is gonna be 0.2 to the fifth. 0.2 to the fifth power, 0.2 to the fifth power. And so that, in fact, is equal to 0 0.00032. In other words, it's really unlikely. Okay, thanks for watching the video.